We are recording. For those of you just joining the recording, because we had some technical problems, I just want to let you know that we are about 30 minutes into a two hour session here. We had difficulties to stop the first part from being recorded. So two things here. One is we do have a slide deck with speaker notes and we would encourage you to go back to that. We'll make that available through the CLA, the California Library Association website sooner than later. And you can go back and catch up on that. Second thing is the briefest of summaries of what, what we've been through and panel members that want to add anything to this, feel free to do that before we jump back into where we were. But what we've done so far is talk about the importance of storytelling and advocacy. We started off with the four of us talking about what advocacy meant to us in terms of talking about things we've seen and things we've done as examples to all the participants here to kind of inspire you as to what's going on. We have encouraged people in the live session to see this as a chance to start planning out their own activities. And we're about to get into that with some of the stuff we're doing now, encouraging people to take their own notes. So that by the end of the session, they and you, watching the archive version, will have kind of a, the beginning of an action plan for where to go as an advocate. We've talked about the fact that this is very personal and we're gonna circle back to that. And that really pretty much captures the beginnings of it. Genty, who's one of our panelists, just finished talking about the differences between those tax exempt organizations, 501 c 3 C4s, et cetera, et cetera, about how that affects your advocacy uh, efforts. And our punchline there was, before you advocate, make sure that you're familiar with your own organization's guidelines, rules, regs, talk to your managers, talk to your supervisors, talk to your HR people, and look at your HR manual to make sure you don't do anything that causes problems for you or your organization. You're approaching this with the best of intentions. You're approaching this with an open and good heart to make your library and your community better. And the last thing any of us want to do is lead you down a path that would cause problems for you. So make sure that you're setting yourself up for success by understanding what you can do in your own organization. The slide you're looking at right now is from an OCLC report that Genty just finished talking about. It talked about library support, where it is and where it's been going. So again, you'll see some of that in the slide deck and there's a link to that also listed in the slide deck. With that said, we're gonna jump back into the interactive part of this. If you're watching the archive version, please use this time to come up with your own answers and jot them down so that you have something to work with. But the million dollar question here at the end of this particular segment, once we get that slide working, because things are a little slow on, on PowerPoint slides today, question for people in the live session, and you can answer this through the chat window. What excites you most about advocacy? Now, answer this in the chat, but also jot down your answers because this is your guiding light as you start thinking, what do I do as an advocate after this session? So the question's out there. What are we hearing from you? I did the first round. Mike, do you want to read the answers here and do the comments as the chat responses come through? Thank you. Happy to. All right. All right. So we have educating my community, getting results, yes to results, and yes to education, educating the community. I think one thing that we all know as um, library supporters and library workers is, is that our education, our, our role in education is never done. Giving patrons a voice and letting decision makers know how libraries impact them, of course. It's always about, it's, it's not just about the numbers, it's about the lives that you impact, progress, working with legislators and the legislature, connecting with the community to um, establish continued support, giving community members credit for progress achieved through their advocacy, absolutely. It's always about the feedback back to thank you, your advocates for the time that they took to, to get the results that you need. Discovering new advocates, creativity in your advocacy, breaking stereotypes, and better uh, to educate yourself by better understanding the issues. All of those are, are excellent. Um, the, I love the inevitable, I love my library conversations that come up. Yeah, those are always, uh, those are always great. All right, this is a really wonderful list. Uh, thank you for, your, for including this or for typing this into the chat. We appreciate it, thank you. Let's take a, a deep breath here. Those of you that have been with the live session now for about 40 minutes, do you have any questions so far about what we're proposing here? Anything that we covered in such a cursory manner you want to explore it before we dive into the next part, which is approaches to advocacy? If not, you can simply type no into the chat. If you do have those questions, let's deal with those now so that we don't lose them. Those of you watching the archive version, you can send us a carrier pigeon and we'll go, okay, it's time to move on. Um, I see a comment uh, educating my community. Um, how can iSchools or LIS, LIS educators help? That is a, a wonderful question. Anybody on the panel want to deal with that one? 
Yes. Um, All right then. So, <laughs> um, um, uh, not to. I think that the best role um, that um, um, information schools, high schools, and educators can help is with. It's there's two things. I think it's getting students excited about this work. It's necessary work. Um, explaining the need for advocacy and that it really never ends. And I'm creating, I will, would be wonderful to have a cohort of students who are enthusiastic about this work and ready to kind of help us. Um, it's, um, we all have, a lot of us who are advocates are doing this in our spare few minutes here and there. And it's always wonderful to have some other folks who can do the same. Um, and uh, like also to say, um, getting some diversity of age and other types of diversity in our advocacy is always helpful. And I, um, uh, information school students are um, a slightly different uh, group than um, you know when I went to library school for sure. Yeah, but I know you went to San Jose State uh, in the management program for an LIS degree. What takeaways did you have there as a learner rather than as an educator in terms of how it set you up for successful advocacy? Uh, the program was unusual um, and didn't last very long, sadly, but <clears throat> advocacy was certainly something that we uh, talked about and that we, I mean, formally talked about as part of the, as part of the, um, the curriculum. And I, I believe that Patrick um, probably is teaching some classes there, Patrick from every library, which is wonderful. Um, but we actually, um, did classes on how to present, how to do a PowerPoint, it was long ago, how to do a PowerPoint presentation, that sort of thing. Um, and, and it was really wonderful, especially for the people who had never done it before and, and really thought that it wasn't their job to do it. And because I was there as an advocate, you know, that's what I, uh, that was my metier, I think. Um, it was a little easier for me, but it was wonderful to see that, that um, somebody, and most of the people in the class were mid-level managers were going to go forth and really realize how important advocacy truly is and where it can lead a, a library and the community. I, I've jumped in there uh, like Deborah as a former learner uh, at a fairly late stage in my own professional career and say that if you are a student on this program and you're trying to figure out where this all fits in, let me encourage you to be really positive and proactive in your own efforts. I found going back to school in my early 50s to get my Master of Library and in Information Science degree that a lot of the learners were there to check off a list and get a degree and just do something on paper and didn't think about the long-term impact it had. By that point in my career, I no longer cared about the paper. I cared about what it was gonna do for my ability to serve the people I was working with. And I found that there were a lot of great professors that were wonderful advocates for library systems, for different aspects of learning in libraries. And they were getting ignored by the learners because the learners would go to class, do the assignments, and that was it. A stunning moment for me came when we had one of those rare moments in this online program where we were all together on campus for a few days. And at the end of the first day when, or the end of the first morning, actually, when people had been introducing their departments and the research they were going, uh, doing at that point, I was the nerd in the group running up and saying, hey, I know we're going to have lunchtime groups. Can I be in your group? And the guy started to laugh. He says, there's going to be no group. You want to talk? Just join me. And I thought, but the work you're talking about is brilliant. I can't imagine that with 130 of us here, that there wouldn't be like a body in every seat around whatever table you've got. And he was right. I was wrong. Sadly enough, I think for the other learners, I had a one on one with the guy that had a major influence on how I approached that particular part of librarianship. And I would encourage you if you're in school now, reach for those opportunities. The people like Deborah, that Deborah just mentioned, like Pat Sweeney, who we're going to have in November as part of the series, these are people who are brilliant and accessible. They want to be talking to you. And if you hold back thinking, well, I'm just a learner, you know, that, that I'm just a something, if you let that get in your way, you're missing wonderful opportunities. So I would encourage you to do that. Jeffy, anything you want to add about LIS programs and what we can do to tie that into advocacy at a better level? Yeah, you know, again, it is really about, I think, uh, it, it, all of you covered it, but I, I'll actually talk about uh, not just LIS, but all of us, and you'll, you'll have heard me talk about this, and I know Deborah is always willing to help me with this, is 
our willingness to come out and talk to you. So if you have a group or if you have a support group or foundation or friends, or even if you're a group of informal students who want to learn about uh, advocacy, reach out to us and we will talk to you. We will talk to you about the value of what we do, of the different groups that are out there you can be part of, that you can join and the support you can get your role. So, you know, definitely we are willing and able to help you. And, you know, I mean, obviously we don't know everything everything, but we do know a lot. All of us bring a lot of experience and we are more than happy to come and help, you know, educate or help you learn. So. Thank you, everyone. So let's move into the second part. We've got several parts. We won't bore you with how many parts are ahead of you, but we will just tell you we've got a full schedule and want to keep you excited and going. Part two, we're going to talk a little bit about our own approaches to advocacy in terms of what we might share with you and encouraging you to do the same thing. We would be really remiss if we didn't do the formal introduction of every library, which we keep mentioning to you. John Kraska, Pat Sweeney are two of the prime movers here. Pete Bromberg just moved into a position with them that's very exciting for the organization. If you're new to this and you really want to get your feet wet, the two books that John and Patrick have written before the ballot and the other one that's slightly behind that one here up on the screen, wonderful primers that take you through a lot of the basics. And it will be no surprise to you if you do go through those books that a lot of what's in there is weaving its way through today's session because these are from the heart things done by some of our best colleagues in the industry talking about how what advocacy means to them. I'm going to give you a quick four-part introduction here to what I think are important elements to keep in mind in terms of advocacy, then open it up a little bit to panelists for their comments. And again, encourage you to put in any questions you've got. So starting off with the idea that I said up front, um, for those of you that missed the record, the, for those of you watching the recording and didn't hear this, I made the point up front that this is really a personal endeavor. You put your heart and your soul into it. You do it because it matters to you. And you're not just thinking about yourself. What you're really thinking about here is your role in your organization and your community and thinking about what kind of changes you can dream of to bring to fruition rather than setting a low bar and saying, I think I can only do this and that's as far as I'm going to go. We have over the last several months, obviously, this last year and a half actually, had a lot of, of interesting experiences with what does it mean to be personal in a pandemic era? What does it mean to be personal in an age when we used to talk about blended learning, which, where some of it was on site and some of it would go online, and we'd have those awful things where you had some wonderful face-to-face -face interactions on site, and then you went into an environment where it was a bunch of checklists and a bunch of quick lectures, and you checked off a box and you were done with it. We've seen that same thing in communication, where it's really become blended, and I, as a trainer, my heart was in this already before the pandemic, but it's only become 10 times worse for me as a trainer. For me, if I don't have that combination of face-to-face -face and online face-to-face, -face, which is what we're doing today via Zoom, I feel like something's missing and we're not taking advantage of what's there. So think in terms of personal as being not only when you're physically with somebody, but you're online with them and have the opportunity to interact. The opportunities are magnificent. Like our libraries, which are in their best situations well-organized, we want our efforts to be well-organized. Advocacy doesn't just spring out of nowhere and magically accomplish something in a two or four or six week period. We've seen those extreme examples, like with the March for Our Lives thing, where the kids in Parkland went through that shooting on Valentine's Day in 2018, six weeks later. They had 563 marches all over the world because A, they were speaking from the heart, B, they were well organized, C, they were prepared. They were already students who were sophisticated in the use of social media. Some of them were theater students in their schools. All the experiences we have are lining us up for that awful moment or that great moment when we feel galvanized and we move forward. An organization is really at the heart of being able to take the skills we have and working through it. The opportunity to engage obviously chose this particular image because it just hammers home that idea that it's no longer there's my screen life and here's my what we call real life. That whole concept of in real life being physically only face to face is moving so quickly as an antiquated idea that if you're not comfortable yet with online interactions, and I think most of you probably are based on what I'm seeing in the chat, but if you're not, push yourself with the support of people around you who are really adept at this and see what the possibilities open up to you in terms of doing some of your stuff face-to-face -face and online. Mike actually has a wonderful story that I want to have him retell you here in terms of going from on-site to online during the pandemic. Mike? Yeah, so um, when we were planning our day in the district, CLA's annual effort to reach legislators um, in the spring, uh, we obviously knew we couldn't meet in person and we were um, setting up a Zoom call with um, Assembly Member Aguiar Curry. She is a wonderful 
library supporter. And up here in the northern part of the state, the legislative districts can be quite large geographically. And so we were able to get a, everyone on a call who represent, I think, almost every library system that was in her district. We had someone from Windsor in Sonoma County. We had someone in Roanert Park. We had someone from Napa. We had, I was on the call from Fairfield. And we had someone from Davis where um, Aggie R. Curry's office is, her district office is, one of her district offices, and then someone in West Sacramento. We had a wonderful conversation with her and that probably wouldn't have happened. All of us would not have been able to join her in that office because it would have taken us, I mapped it all out, it would have, we would have traveled 528 miles to get to her office in Davis, but we're able to do it from home and we were able to have a wonderful connection with her share our story, share our concerns, and have um, her tell us um, what her goals are. Um, so it's, you know, we used to do this in person, but sometimes the online is better and, um, and it allows for more people to engage in it because you can do it from your office and you can do it from home. I'm gonna put you on the spot for a minute. Sorry to do this, but not sorry to do this. What was your first reaction when the pandemic hit and you started to have to do this kind of advocacy online? How'd you feel about it? Um, well, I felt not great, um, and I figured, you know, there would be technolo technological challenges. I always think that in-person allows you to build a, bit, a little bit more rapport. You can sense the warmth of someone, um, but we've all gotten used to doing this, and so it's you found ways to show your, your kindness, to show your warmth, and to show your interest, and I think that that helps. And, you know, you just got to get over the technological issues. I was, I mentioned earlier, I was on a call with Senator Dodd and Zoom was not having it that day. Um, I had to, it was my turn to talk. He's waiting for me to talk. Nobody can hear me. And so I had to quick call in on the call in phone and a phone number. And he was very gracious about it. Um, we had a good chuckle about it and we moved on. And there you've actually anticipated the next question I was going to ask you. Any tips you'd offer? And the obvious tip that Mike is offering those of you who are not as comfortable yet with using Zoom for advocacy or anything else is when you face that awful moment of a tech problem, don't let it take you down. Remember, the technology is the tool. This is still all about interpersonal relationships, which is what advocacy is about. So if your technology is starting to go wonky on you, work around it. Keep looking for things that you can do. As a trainer, I've always said, halfway jokingly, halfway seriously, if I go into a classroom to teach and my group is waiting for me to be able to facilitate a meaningful conversation that will give them positive results, I'm going to teach by candlelight and holding up paper copies of my slides if I have to do that to get the message across. When we have a mission to do, the technology can be frustrating, but it is secondary to that whole thing of making personal contact. And Mike's example of saying, this is how I've got around it is a, a good example of how we do that. And again, we didn't plan this, of course, but today when we hoped that we were gonna be recording this entire session, and uh, unfortunately hit unanticipated problems in spite of the fact that we did rehearsals and we've, we've all been doing this with Zoom for a while, it didn't take us down. We went ahead with minimum disruptions, got it going. And then when we had the opportunity about 30, 40 minutes into it to actually pick up what part of it we could and record it, it was a no brainer for all of us to do this kind of work to say, all right, it doesn't have to be perfect. Those watching the archive version don't have to have been there from the beginning. We are trainers, we are facilitators, we can do this and we can work around it. So a great tip to you is do not let the challenges take you down. If they do, you're gonna have a, a very hard time of succeeding in advocacy. Deborah and Genty, any tips you would offer in terms of working in online environments for advocacy or anything else? Genty, you wanna go? I'm just going to say, actually, you know, I love the online environment. It works very well. And I don't think we're ever going away from it. It really, it's like Mike said, you know, if you have to travel 500 miles or if you, and you can just do a Zoom call, we would probably choose the Zoom call. It's green, it's the good way to do it. And, you know, I'll tell you, if you, and many people don't believe this of me, but I am a very strong introvert, and it can be really kind of sometimes hard for me to be in a face-to-face -face environment. And so Zoom has really, really helped me. So I think it has a lot of benefits and, uh, you know, take advantage of those. Mm -hmm. And also, I think that uh, these sessions, they, they permit, if you're talking to legislators or you're talking to their aides, they permit them not to be looking at the next appointment, to not be looking at uh, whatever it is that they have to do that night. They, they actually, if you can catch their attention, they really are 
very present with you. And I think that um, relationships have been built over over technology that we not ne that we wouldn't necessarily have been able to create. So clearly, I'm an advocate of going to wherever your people are. You know, if, if it's online, you want to be online. You want to be comfortable. If it's face to face, wonderful. It just got back from my first conference in almost 18 months and enjoyed every minute of it, even though we were socially distanced, even though we were masked, even though as a presenter, I was horrified to walk into a, a big rectangular room and see that what I was facing instead of the usual tables of people that could interact with each other, I was facing something that looked like an airplane runway, <laughs> trying to figure out how am I gonna connect with these people? We just do it. That's the skill that is needed in librarianship and advocacy, and it's so much more than what we do. And finally, out of those three tips we've already been talking about, let's get down to the fourth one. Again, sorry for the wonkiness of the slides. Here we go. So the fourth one is, in terms of advocacy, it really is grounded in telling stories. What a surprise. You've been listening to us for 45 minutes, telling our stories and sharing some of the ones you've been kind enough to put in there. If you can tell a good story briefly to the heart, as quickly as possible and not give a person a chance to back off because it's so intriguing that they want to hear more, you know you're well on the way to success. And in, in terms of telling killer stories, Genty, why don't you go ahead and, and tell us another one that you've told us in the past that we really adore. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, before I tell the story, one thing I just want to say is most of us in libraries, we're, you know, usually looking for money for additional funding. And today our focus is on polit political and legislative ad advocacy. But I just want you to know that every single point that we are mentioning here, this idea of approach to advocacy being personal, being, you know, an opportunity for engagement, well-organized, grounded in effective storytelling, they are great fundraising tools. I'll tell you, especially, and one of my areas that I'm really interested in is uh, reaching out to large donors. These work, these are tools. So just think of this as, you know, the bonus you're getting from this training. <laughs> so, but to get back to this picture, this is probably my all time favorite picture in my entire career. And uh, many of you have seen me showing this over and over, but this was taken in when I was the director at uh, uh, Monterey County Free Libraries at our San Lucas in uh, the town of San Lucas. And what it is, as you can tell, there are these two little girls here. It, they were, it was on the day of their first Holy Communion. And they were going to go from church to the party, the celebration in their family, uh, their family celebration. But it was the same day that the bookmobile arrives in the in the little town. Now, San Lucas has a population of approximately 400 people. It's a tiny little town. The library plays a key role in that town. It's really the only source of entertainment. San Lucas, in my 12 years as director in Monterey County Free Libraries, had only two years when they had consistently had portable drinking water. So you can see this is a town of real need. The, you know, almost no one, uh, very few people actually had internet in their house. So they really look forward to having this uh, bookmobile and would use it. And so of course, this is the day of the bookmobile arriving. And these little girls were like, you know, forget the party. We got out of church. We are going to the bookmobile to work on the internet. And it's, it's just fascinating that also that their families understood the value and let them do this, that go straight from church to the bookmobile. And so this was at a time when we were in the process of doing some broadband, uh, we were doing some broadband advocacy at the state. Uh, state legislator. And we had got this uh, last minute call from, you know, our, uh, we have wonderful, you know, lobbyists, we have Karen DeCaro and Mike Dillon. And at that time, I'm not sure if Karen, uh, I mean, Christina DeCaro's, excuse me, and Mike Dillon. And I think it was Mike at that time, Christina, I'm not sure she had joined as yet. But uh, he had said, do you have any stories? Or do you have information that you can give us that we can use for this broadband advocacy? And so I said, I have a story. But what I really have is a picture. And so I sent this in and this picture was such a hit. He printed off multiple copies and it got distributed all over Sacramento. And it was, you know, this is like, it went viral, but it went viral in paper form, if you can believe that. And it was very effective and really helped in getting this, um, you know, this legislate uh, the particular bill passed. So I just want to say how important the value of storytelling is, but a picture is a 
amazing that it's a cliche, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. It really is. And every time without fail, I go for Dwayne the district. When I went to Washington, D.C., when I go to Washington, D.C. for our National Library Legislative Day, I always take pictures and I really, really encourage you to carry pictures if you can. So. Clearly, storytelling is important to those of us involved in the Ursula Meyer Advocacy Fund training series. We've been collecting stories uh, with some of the advocates. You might recognize a few of the names up on the screen there. Deborah was actually the first person to do one of these. These are interviews I set up where we do them by type chat. We spend about an hour going over aspects of advocacy and posting those on that site. So if you're taken by stories and you want to learn from some of the masters in our industry in terms of what advocacy means, I would encourage you to go to that website. You can see the URL toward the bottom. But even without jotting down the URL, just remember, if you go to the CLA website and look for the advocacy page, which is pretty clearly marked from the home page, you'll find that toolkit, which is an ever-growing list of things. And today's session is going to be yet another element of that as we move from the posting of tool links to posting some of these live sessions that we're doing. And finally, by the end of the year, having a whole toolkit that will be a distillation of annotations off that tool page. So we're really moving forward on this. We take it very seriously that the sharing of information is part of what we can do. And that's what the bequest that is behind the Ursula Meyer Advocacy Fund training program is helping us to do for you. With that said, let's get it back to you and hear your voices for a minute here. What approaches have worked well for you in your own advocacy work? Again, two things here. You wanna jot these down as you remember them so that you put together your own advocacy plan for after today's session. The second thing is share your own stories to inspire others. I'll uh, see, Deborah, you have not done the chat thing. You wanna handle this one? Sure. Great, thank you. So let's get those comments coming in. Establishing ideas, great. We found the use of K to 12 children is very effective. That makes sense. More pictures and uh, conversations. Short two to three minute videos that can be shared with compelling anecdotal stories can be very effective. Crystal, can you do a follow up there and describe whatever software you've used, whether it's free or for charge? Because a lot of people who haven't done videos are probably looking and saying, I can't do that. And what I'd like you to make the point on here is, yeah, you can if you know where, where to go. So if you can put a couple suggestions in for Deborah to read out, that would be wonderful. Sending a representative to speak to McCarthy. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, editorial. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to, uh, you know, just mention something, you know, videos and uh, pictures, especially of children, very effective, but being very careful, you get permission to use them. Or like, in, you know, the case of the little, the, the first Holy Communion pictures we put up is they were, you notice there are no faces in that picture. So it was really, and it was totally unplanned. And I want to give credit to the bookmobile librarian at that time, Liz Bednar at Warner County Free Libraries who took the picture and she loves taking pictures at all times, but being sure you take, get permission if you're taking pictures of children, especially. I want to mention that. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, using a library model for the Ronan Park Senior Center. We're happy about that in Sonoma County. It can be done with basic video stuff, iPhones, et cetera, but we did it at NYPL with a whole marketing team. <clears throat> and absolutely, yes, you need permission and releases, but very often parents, caregivers are more than willing. Uh, another one, connecting with the decision makers, someone they know in the visiting team from their district who has done a project in their area of interest. Great idea. We'll get into this a little bit later in today's workshop with you, but one point that we all make consistently about this is when you're getting in touch with the decision makers, remember that sometimes the real key movers in a legislative office are the legislative assistants, not necessarily the elected representatives themselves. Can't tell you how many projects I've worked on personally inside and outside of libraries where knowing that key legislative aid was the difference between getting somebody like a mayor or a supervisor to sign off on something. You want to build those things well before you need them. Okay, let's do one more quick segment here and then take a, a brief break so people can get up and stretch. What we want to do now is just 
call attention to a few of the many, many organizations that are out there that can help you in your advocacy efforts. Say they're involved in advocacy, they do advocacy training, and they are just looking for people like you to get involved. So let us start off with CLA. Genty, you wanna uh, take the lead on this one? You're still muted. I was just gonna say, Deborah, did you want to introduce the various groups, including I know CPLA, which we don't have on the screen. Uh, Paul, do you mind going back to the previous screen? Not so at Deborah all. can just introduce them. Sure, Paul was right. <clears throat> There are a number of organizations, uh, the ones that are on the screen, and then there are several others that, that are not listed on the screen, but, um, but it just gives you an indication of the wealth of the wealth of resources that you really have once you get involved in this. So we're not, we're not sending you down a rabbit hole. It's a, it's a vast field of information, in fact. So the California Library Association, and Paul is one of the um, results of CLA really deciding that uh, we need to move forward with a formal advocacy program, and uh, uh, you know, and mercifully, we've got a, we got got a gift to do that. So, check all of these websites because there's all kinds of information about everything. The American Library Association also has um, wonderful information. Sometimes too much, people think. Um, and so, if you can't find your way into ALA, write to one of us. You know, tell us what you want, and we can try to point you point you there. There is a, a, a division of the American Library Association called United for Libraries. And um, I'm on the board of United for Libraries, a uh, small commercial, and uh, and the chair of their advocacy committee. And we are Friends Foundation folks, um, a lot of librarians also, but, um, but we've been doing advocacy in ALA um, for a very, very long time. And we are delighted that, that ALA is now picking up the banner. And, uh, and so we have all kinds of stuff on our specific website as well. Every library, Paul's mentioned it, I've mentioned it. You know, they're a wonderful, uh, wonderful group of folks who, who are not a 501c3. And so they actually can go out and do political activism that is, uh, that's really important. Um, and, and they do different things than, than some of you will be doing in, in your own advocacy, but their lessons are tremendous. And you can use <clears throat> all the information they give you, except the ask. You know, <laughs> so, and asks are very important. Don't get me wrong; you you absolutely can do asks, but but some of the asks that they make, maybe not so much. Um, and here in California, we have something called the California Public Library Advocates, uh, and uh, it, it is a merger of an organization that that really uh, focused on um, uh, foundations and trustees. And now it, it focuses on friends, trustees, foundations. We've been, we're working on redoing our website, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's really important. And we hope to be getting out to do board training um, in the next year and get some videos on online. Um, Ann Davis, the president was here and made a great suggestion earlier on. Um, and I'm sorry, we didn't get a chance to welcome her directly, but, uh, but she was here. So. Um, if you're looking for information, it's absolutely out there. And um, and if it isn't, then we will put it on there once you give it to us. So um, this is not, no one is trying to hold the information close. We want it to be out to as many people as possible. And, you know, it's amazing. I'll just use this to, to say, it's amazing how few people, it, it doesn't take a whole lot. As, as Mike said, it, sometimes it's just a core group of people who make the connection and make the point that really catches the attention of someone who can make a difference, whether it's a legislator or a fundraiser or a corporation. Um, but, but the more people that are aware and the more people that can maybe make a telephone call when a general call to action is made is really critical. So don't forget, don't forget your friends, even if they, they only do book sales right now, they can do more, truly. Anyway, over to you, Paul. Okay, so back to CLA. Okay. All right. Thank you, Deborah. And so, you know, as the president of CLA, first of all, I really want to thank everyone who's act, who's part of this training. And so really special thanks to Paul for, you know, really being the facilitator and putting all of this together, bringing us all together. Deborah, Mike, thank you so much for, you know, really being willing to take the time to not only do this presentation, but I know, you know, just planning, there's a lot of work that goes on and all of the advocacy you do anyway. So thank you very much for this. And I also want to thank CLA for really sponsoring this. This is great. And 
Thank you to all of you who are here and attending. I appreciate the, your willingness and your desire to be advocates and to learn more about this. So, And with that, let me tell you a little bit about CLA because we are probably the leading uh, advocates in the state. But of course, as Deborah said, you know, CPLA, there are many other groups that do a lot of work. But just, you know, many of you don't know about uh, uh, CLA and I, you know, you have heard me this last year, I'm constantly harping on about invite me, invite me to your meeting so I can come and tell you about CLA. So, you know, I'm not about to miss this chance. But for those of you who don't know, just a little background, this is our 126th year of supporting you. CLA has been around for a very long time. So CLA was really established in 1895, and it started as the Library Association of Central California. Go Central California, I know you don't get enough attention. We really thank you for this. <laughs> and then in uh, 1906, we became CLA, we became the statewide organization. And CLA has been working for libraries and library communities since then very strongly. So, you know, we have created many library initiatives. Even fun ones like, you know, we actually started the Library Week, which then went on to become National Library Week. And then, of course, we have the we were among the first groups to actually establish a intellectual freedom community a committee, and that was in the 1940s. And then among, uh, we've always worked very closely with the state librarian and the state library. And in the 50s, under the sort of direction or under the suggestion of the state librarian, we created our legislative and advocacy committee. You know, we've done a lot. We were also among the first state, li uh, state associations to actually denounce the Patriot Act. So we've really done a lot. We've, you know, we're always there. And just, and I'm going to pass this off to, uh, to Mike in a minute, but I also want to remind all of you, this is September is National Library, uh, is a library uh, card sign up month. And how many of you are doing something of, uh, you know, you're using this opportunity? Because remember that even though it is about card signups, it's about awareness. There are huge groups. You're not going to get a lot of new signups this month, but you can create awareness of, about how amazing you are and why people, uh, you know, what the value of the library card is. And with that, I would like to introduce us to uh, introduce all of us to one of our co-chairs of our le legislative committee here. Mike has done an amazing job. This has been actually a fantastic year. I can't tell you, I'm so proud to have had the opportunity to be, um, you know, president during this year. We have done so much, you know, simple things like getting the early release of Lunch of the, li Lunch of the Library money. But our budget, all of you know, this has been absolutely life changing for us. This is a game changer that the budget that Governor Newsom signed, we have over half a billion. That is a billion with a B you know, dollars that have been devoted to libraries. So thank all of yourselves, because this really came as a result of advocacy. This was not just, it did not just happen. We really put a lot of work into it. And I have to say, big kudos to our uh, legislative committee. And uh, here we have Mike. So I will turn it over to you, Mike. All right. Um, just going to, uh, as Paul puts the information on the screen, I'll just share a little bit of information with you. Um, so the, um, and I'm co-chairing the committee with Yolande Wilburn. She was unable to, to make it today. Yolande is the city librarian in Torrance. Uh, I know a lot of the presenters are today or we're Northern California focused, but we do have folks from all over the state on our committee and we're always looking for people to join us. Um, so we really, this is a, one of our primary focuses is really getting a, a network of people. I, we will exploit any contact we have. It'd be like, you know, I talked to somebody once somewhere who I think works there. Let me see what I can do. And so any information that we have, or if we know someone, we're always looking to have more people that we can share information with. I'm sure you've seen emails from me and Yolande. We do, a, we're pretty active on Calix. Um, we really try and keep the information flowing to people and particularly when it comes to action items. One of the things that we do in partnership with our lobbyists uh, who um, Christina and Mike is we really look 
for bills that are of interest to libraries, could impact libraries, or that we think libraries should have a role in and figure out a way for us to either support that information, to support that legislation, or to ask for changes. Sometimes, you know, the what comes out is not um, helpful to us. And so we have to push back a little bit. And, the, you know, those conversations can be difficult, uh, but they're necessary because one of the things is being an effective advocate is making sure that um, while someone thinks that they might be helping, that they're not actually adding more of a burden to libraries. Um, um, we certainly have seen that in the past couple of years with some proposed legislation that on its face would seem like it would be something we would um, just celebrate. But then when we actually have to have some tough conversations about actually this is um, more difficult um, and it more burdensome than, than you would like to think it is. Yeah, stop just a second here to put in a plug for the next in this series. This series, by the way, runs on the second Wednesday of each month, starting at 10. Most sessions will run from 10 to noon Pacific time. The next one with Mike Dillon, who Mike Eitner has just been talking about, and Christina DeCaro, his daughter, uh, is going to be a really knockout one in the sense that they are our legislative analysts, and they've been doing this for a long time. So if you want to hear the inside view of how lobbyists work on behalf of the association and pick up some great tips from them, strongly urge you to come to that one. That, that'll be in October. I think it's the second Wednesday of October. Back to you, Mike. Yes. So um, this, uh, I think this one speaks for itself. We can go on to the next. A lot of what um, the committee does, and if please, if you're interested, I'm, I'm going to say it again. We're always looking for members. Um, it's a, it's a, we ask for a four-year commitment, um, a four-year term. Um, members are appointed by the the CLA president, and um, we're always, always looking for more voices and not just library workers. You know, we, we are so thankful to have Deborah on the committee. We have Chris Knoll, who is an architect and has designed beautiful library buildings. It's, we want a breadth and depth of experience and support for libraries. It, it, it isn't just for librarians and it isn't just for library directors either. Um, and let's see, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you just don't know what's gonna happen. I know I've been, I have texted um, the current CLA president at uh, Saturday night at eight o'clock, be like, all right, we gotta work on this real quick. Um, so some, sometimes things move quickly and you have to be nimble and, and work within the constraints that you have. The legislative process will move on whether you're ready or not. Here's a tip for all advocates. Remember to turn off your cell phones after five o'clock on Saturdays, otherwise, you're in. <laughs> Deborah, the, no, 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 please don't do that. We've already talked a lot about the American Library Association. Deborah did a wonderful introduction to that, talked about every library quite a bit today. And again, you'll hear Patrick Sweeney in November on the second Wednesday of that month. Looking forward to having you for that. Uh, we are documenting as much as we can some of the advocacy organizations locally as well as nationally on our advocacy tools page through CLA. So there's a, a quick list. As Deborah said, it's not complete by any stretch of the imagination. And if you already know about an organization that we should have up there and don't have on there, feel free to email me directly. It's paul at paulsignorelli.com. I'm the one putting the, the list together and running those through our wonderful CLA webmaster. So we're always updating that thing. Uh, we we're going to pop a question here about what, how can you best use the resources offered by advocate organizations, but we're running just slightly behind where we want to be. We want to make sure that people are able to unglue themselves from their chair. So at this point, I'm going to suggest we take the five minute break that we were going to take. For those of you in real time, let's just round it off, say it's about 1120 now. Let's come back live at 1125. What will happen next is Holly's going to turn off the recording so that we can all take a break. Uh, I'll at least stay on here live with anybody that wants to chat offline during the next five minutes. And then when we're ready to start again, I'll give Holly a heads up. She'll start the recording. We'll have about 10 seconds of silence just in case any editing has to be done afterwards. I want to give her a little bit of window there. So the plan is take a break, get up, stretch, um, shout, shout at the top of your lungs, plan what you're going to do for the next three years as an advocate. And we'll see you in about seven minutes. Welcome back everybody. Hope you enjoyed your three hour break in five minutes or less. Uh, we're gonna jump into the last part of this, which will be three shorter sections that sort of give you themes that we will explore throughout the rest of this particular four part series and continue on into next year as we plan out what the Ursula Myers Advocacy Fund Training Program is gonna to continue to develop into. 
urge you to continue putting in your questions in chat. We'll answer as many of those as we can as we go through. Right now, what we want to start focusing on is the relationships behind advocacy. So what we've got up here is a chart that one of our colleagues put together for the earlier version of this presentation in May. It's a reminder that there are all kinds of people that you reach out to in your community. I'm just going to leave this up there for a few seconds and invite anybody on the panel to make observations about what they see in there that has spoken to them so that we can share some tips to you of what that chart means to us and what, what it may mean to you as you try to put it into effect. Anybody in the panel want to jump in? Uh, you know, I just want to say this idea of never um, underestimating someone you see, never make any assumptions. You'd be surprised at the power of people's advocacy. You know, it doesn't matter who they are, what they look like, what they, you know, what their income level is. You, you, anyone can be a very strong advocate for you and a very powerful advocate for you. So just being, you know, keep all your assumptions and stereotypes and all of that aside when you're reaching out. Truly, I think that um, this is a great opportunity to do some research. You know, look, look up the person that you're trying to take a look at, see what organizations he or she belongs to. Do you know some of those folks? I mean, if you can find a personal connection who can give you some information, that's really, really good. And also it gives you a sense of, of what they're committed to, why they ran for office, what they're doing in that job. Um, listening, not just with your ears, but, you know, listening as part of the community is a really great way to find that space where you can actually have a meaningful conversation with that person. Um, you know, the, the notion of churches and organizations that they belong to is, it, it's really important. And, uh, and also, um, sometimes people, they, they don't brag or they don't tell you all the organizations that they belong to. And, um, and man, you can miss a lot of opportunities to, to reach other people if you don't, if you're not listening to, for those kinds of connections or looking for those kinds of connections. Mike, any observations from you? Um, I will just say it's slightly related to the slide here, which is uh, sometimes it can be very intimidating to talk to elected official. And so I always like to start with my city council members and mayors and, um, and because they tend to be politically ambitious people and that your city council person could become your board of supervisor person, could become your assembly member, could become your state senator and could become your federal representative. And so start with your city council members, start with your other local elected officials, build a relationship early. It will most likely pay off long, 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 long time down the road. Yeah, we've often spoken about the importance of having that elevator speech so that when you're meeting somebody at this level for the first time, you make your point quickly and you intrigue them. You wanna give a, an elevator speech about elevator speeches here? Have one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go go a little further. That was a short elevator ride. Let's go to the third floor now. <laughs> you talked about the importance of having it when we did the interview about six months ago. Uh, would you mind repeating to people what you told me in terms of why you have that and the different versions you have, what it can accomplish when you actually end up in that figurative elevator and you've got the 30 seconds to pitch them? Was that to me? That, that was to you, yeah. Oh, sorry. I remember sorry. that, right? We, we had that conversation together <laughs> a long, a long, long time, time ago. ago. Um, honestly, you have to make sure that you know what you want. You, you have to have various, you know, if, if you run into a legislature, you know, if you're in Washington and you, and you think, golly, I might run into a legislature, have the speech ready. No, no, hi, I'm, um, this is what we're here for. This is what I think you can do for me. Are you willing to do it? That's Thank pretty you. much it. <laughs> That, that was a good first to the third floor elevator ride pitch so that you can explain to people what we're talking about. Remember here that, as Deborah has said so many times, you, you're never finished with your elevator speech, with that pitch. And it varies from person to person. You have to have it so malleable that when you see that person you've been waiting to have the conversation with, that you can click into the version that's appropriate to them. And what you don't want to do is try to tell the whole story. You want to say just enough to get them intrigued. So this is storytelling where you don't necessarily get to the punchline and say, here's what I want from you. This is storytelling where you talk about the importance of what you're doing in the hope that you intrigue them. I have clearly and been this involved- this is what in I can what send to you. And this is information that I will send to you after we meet. And make sure, make sure, make sure, here's the Washington speech. 
if you say you're going to do something, do it that day, do it that night, do it, do it, do it, or they will forget you after the 60 other people that have come to them that day uh, have said something else. The difference between success and being like everybody else is doing exactly what Deborah just said. I can't tell you how many times it just happened at a conference I got back from. I'd run into people, we'd have a conversation. Uh, I would promise to do something. Before I got back to my room that night, I would sit down in, in areas where I knew I had Wi-Fi and actually send off that note. And I can't tell you, sadly enough, how many times I got reactions saying, wow, that was really fast. People don't normally move that fast. <laughs> I would honestly say to them, okay, I work at two speeds. I either do it immediately or I remember three years down the road, which doesn't do us very much good. So just taking those extra 20, 50, 70 seconds that it takes to do that follow-up note is exactly what Deborah's getting at there. It makes a difference between whether your advocacy clicks or doesn't click. And again, you want to make sure that you've got that intriguing thing out there. I started to say it's sort of like fundraising and storytelling where you want to tell just enough to get the person hooked. I think a lot of people in fundraising and in training also have the idea that what you want to do is get to the ask as quickly as you can or get to the punchline of a training as fast as you can. And I think that's the opposite of what we need to be doing. As fundraisers, we're not out there directly asking for money. What we're doing is offering an opportunity for somebody to invest in something we believe in. As advocates, it's the same thing. We're talking about something that very much is important to us. If it weren't important to us, why would we be going through the pain and the effort of doing the efforts, making the efforts we're making? So what we're doing is saying, I'm excited about this. Let me tell you about it just enough to see if you're interested. And you know you've got the person when they say, tell me more, or can we set up a meeting? That's the moment you want. You don't want to have that mechanical thing of trying to have your hands into their pocket now so fast that they go, wow, I just lost $100 and I don't know what I invested in. You want them to willingly be part of what you're talking about. Anybody else want to add anything on that theme or should we move on to our next one? I want to really quickly add to what Deborah said about writing that thank you note. And here's a life pro tip, you know, real LPT for you is actually write your thank you note, draft it before the meeting. So in a way you've got the notes, the points written up. And then after you have the meeting, it's really quick to just send it. But if you didn't get to all of the points, you can say, here's what we discussed. And here's some of the things I meant to talk with you, but didn't get a chance to. So you really have it all there. And it really is very fast because writing an email or saying, oh, what did I do? You know, so I, I just recommend if you can have that thank you letter drafted before your meeting, it, it will get out in time and will be very effective. You're so That's smart. A great <laughs> That's a great reminder, Jensi, of something I heard from a colleague at this conference where they were saying, because of the different time zones they work in, if they're trying to impress somebody that they know they're going to meet with, they'll actually have all those things, as you suggested, ready to go ahead of time. They'll use their social media or email accounts to schedule delivery of that thing. And if they know the person well enough, they will actually write two or three notes. They're doing this on a Friday afternoon at the end of a conference. They will schedule the first thing to go out Monday morning. They're here in California. The other person's on the East Coast. So 9.30 in the morning, East Coast time, the person gets the first of those automated things. And the person with stented knows so much what's going to come back that five minutes later, there's a follow-up based on what they knew the person was going to be thinking, which is, oh, and by the way, here's another thought. Says, I'm not getting up at 6.30 in the morning on Monday after a conference, but I want them to think I did. It's a wonderful approach to this. We just need to be creative. <laughs> Jenti was talking to us a little bit as we were prepping for this session about some of the issues of diversity that come into reaching out to people. We've got a couple of slides here where we're going to have her describe the importance of tying this back into our work. So Jenti, again, back to you. So I'll be very quick. I know we have very little time, you know, so I, I just, of course, all of us these days are very aware of diversity and equity. Many of us who work in municipal organizations, our organizations are participants in GARE, which is the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, or, you know, have our own DEI programs, all of that going on. So, you know, I, I don't think I need to really talk about this very good in great detail to you. But I really do want to mention one of my concerns that I talked about, about the OCLC study, which was that uh, focusing on voters, because what, you know, we really talk about diversity and voters, especially traditionally, there has been a limited sort of, what should I say, um, the uh, profile of the voters. 
And what we have really, when we did advocacy, we really focused on what can they vote, you know, who, who will they vote for? We really need to focus on that vote. However, we need to not ignore the rest of our community. We also need to not ignore the power, the economic power of immigrants, new immigrants, which is really huge. These days, the vote power and the economic power are equal. And so really being aware of diversity and there are pockets you know, in all of our organizations. And actually, if you don't mind just going to the next slide, Paul. So this, you know, all of us have seen this picture, this equality versus equity. We've seen it in some form or the other, where it's right, whether it's riding a bicycle, reading for, reaching for apples, looking over the fence, whatever it is. Really, equity is about giving the person that needs that extra help the extra help. It's not about saying, oh, everyone needs equal, you know, needs a boost. We're going to give everyone lunch. Well, it doesn't matter whether you need lunch or not, or whether you actually need lunch and you're the person we're going to give lunch to. So really thinking about what equity means. And it's the same thing in advocacy. It's like who we target, what are the issues we target, and also who are we bringing on board to be our advocates for us? You know, who, how do we work this? And we all know there are huge communities that need a lot of help. Now we're talking about the refugee community. This is, and we have different things. You might have a group, you might be the one organization, the one city that has say, the largest group of, uh, of refugees from say Somalia or from, you know, from, um, from Ethiopia or from Afghanistan and really figuring out how do we serve the community? How do we advocate for them? And so I'm not gonna give you any real answers right now, but what I am going to say is be aware, be conscious, be intentional about how you do advocacy, really making sure that you are being equitable, being very careful about how you talk to people. Again, as I said, throughout those stereotypes, throughout those first impressions, everyone has equal power in terms of how they advocate for you. And everyone has some needs, really being aware of that and focusing on the specific needs when you're advocating, really looking at how you can be inclusive and really focus on all of your community. And so, you know, again, of all of you, and I hope you're already doing this when you're talking in your communities or when you're talking about reaching out, you're not using the word citizen. You're using the word, you know, resident or community member or whatever to really reflect who it it is the libraries serve, that we don't serve just citizens, we serve everyone in our community. And so we advocate for everyone in our community. So just sort of throwing that out as something for you to think about as you work. And with that, I would just say think and feel free to ask questions, we will address them some more. But equity, 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 really think about it. Diversity, you know, inclusiveness, all of that, and probably inclusiveness and equity would be what you really, really need to think about as you're doing advocacy. This is from the hard and, comments yeah. here. Make me want to tell a very quick story that I hadn't anticipated going into today. First, the tip that accompanies it. If you want to be a successful advocate, do not be defensive. At that moment, when you cross the line and you say something you wish you hadn't said and you get called out on it, do not allow your brain to, to go into defense mode because then you shut down and nothing will come of it. Take it in, breathe. If you need a few minutes before you respond, take that time and honor your, your own feelings in that, but address it directly. And the story I'm telling goes hand in hand with what we're talking about today. I was doing another training for the California Library Association about three or four months ago, the train the trainer session. We were doing six sessions together over a three week period. Halfway through the first session, somebody in the group was very sweet about contacting me through private chat instead of raising it in front of everybody. And the question was, I can't help but notice that your deck seems to be stacked in favor of showing all faces of one particular race. And I stopped and I looked at it and I thought, you know, I usually look through a deck for that kind of issue, but for whatever reason I had in that time. Now, in a previous incarnation, I might, might've gotten defensive or confused and thought maybe I'll deal with that later. But because I was gonna be working with this group for six consecutive sessions, I decided let's break off the stage and let's be honest here. So without identifying the person, I said to everybody, I just got a note in private chat. And since we're talking about being a trainer and training others to do this, let me tell you what you do when you get this. First, you acknowledge it, which I'm doing right now. Second is you ask yourself, is there merit in it? And yes, there is merit in it. And I said, the third thing is, I'm glad the person was sweet enough to do 
what she did rather than screaming at me and say, why did you do that? Or all of a sudden getting upset. She was rational. I tried to be rational. It was from the heart. I tried to be from the heart. The result was, of course, by the end of that session, I went back and redid, re-looked at the other decks and made sure that the decks were much more diverse than what they, they put out there. And the result was by the end of the second session, where I always offered people a chance to stay with me after the session formally ended, the person who stayed after the end of session two was the very person who had raised that issue. because she understood that she could trust me, that I was not going to get upset if she asked some difficult questions. We had the most lovely conversations. So as an advocate, don't shoot yourself in the foot. When you make that mistake, not if, when you make that mistake and somebody calls you out on it, assuming they're not embarrassing you in a public setting and you can handle it in a rational way, take it in as much as you can and grow with it. You will be a better advocate and the world will be a better for your efforts in having listened. Let us move into reaching out to elected officials. We've talked about this so much. We won't stay on this a lot here, but some of the tips that we've thrown to each other that I would throw to you, come back to this idea of when you're working with elected officials, don't just go to the top elected official that you're trying to get to. Mike has talked about cultivating people early in their career because it's easy for you and easy for them. These are the kind of long-term things that you want to have. Deborah has time and time again talked about her early experiences and her ongoing experiences working with elected officials. And Jenty and I have never had the conversation, but I'm assuming she has just as many stories. Deborah, do you want to talk about whatever you can recall of your first couple interactions that you've had with elected officials when you were reaching out to ask for something and how you approached it? Well, I can I can remember some horrible examples. <laughs> Which is fine because we learned from those and we remember those. <laughs> um, they moved a bus stop in San Francisco from the main library, uh, which is where the Library for the Blind was also. They moved it a block away or something like that. And I was outraged. I don't believe I even talked to anybody at the, at the library, but I raced into the committee that was talking about this. It was just outraged. And, and, and they heard me. And, uh, and actually, they, I think, had already decided that that was a really stupid thing. And so they moved the bus stuff back. But, but I, I thought, I will never do that again. I didn't know who was on the committee. I didn't know anything. But I was so mad that um, that, that, that happened. I, I will say that I have been incredibly fortunate to have mentors and sponsees when I have gone to um, when I've gone into mayor's offices or if I've gone into legislators offices and they have shown me the ropes, especially ALA has been CLA and ALA was very good. You know, when I first got involved with CLA, we would, we would go to um, Sacramento and talk to the legislators. We don't necessarily do that as much uh, anymore. Some small groups do, but, but it's, it's, it's wonderful to, to find an example. And, and I will say that, um, uniformly the people who are involved in these kinds of things and reaching out to elected officials are happy to share their experience. They're delighted to share phone numbers, emails. They, they want you involved just as much as you may think that you want to be involved. Believe me, if you volunteer, we will suck you in. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> but, yeah, you should. <laughs> people need to be warned that this is not going to be something you just dabble in and then you walk away from it. That's right. That's right. A good friend of mine once said when we were talking about activism, nobody sets out to be an activist. They find that one little thing that has really clicked for them, and that's what inspires them. And then it's like anything else that's pleasurable. You find that you really enjoyed that process and you went forward. Deborah, a potentially unfair question, but I want to ask it anyway. What would the Deborah Doyle of September 8th, 2021 say to the Deborah Doyle who responded in anger to that situation, went racing into a room in anger? What advice would you give that person now? <laughs> I would say, talk to the staff, do the research, um, and and make sure that, and maybe talk to the staff of the supervisors. Um, maybe there's a way that doesn't have to be at a public microphone. Maybe there's a way to communicate that doesn't have to be suddenly it's a it's a me versus me versus them. If if that's the answer, then that's a problem. You know, what we, I think what most of us on the panel have experienced is that if you can find the join, my husband does Aikido, and so he doesn't throw people around, but if you find the join, you can move people in a different direction, and it's, a, and it's kind of a positive direction for everybody. Um, so that would be my, 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 my. Yeah, I would come right back to that. The thing I was fishing for is when you're angry, don't. Yeah. Really, because. If you're angry, the other person's angry too. That whole thing of how we mirror other people, 
advocates don't want to be that angry. We see that all the time in activism when people are on the li picket lines, marching and screaming about things. And yet, how much does that really change minds? It's a display of unity and it's a display of bodies showing that there's an actual support network for, for what the activists are trying to get to. But think about your own reaction. If somebody comes to you really angry about something, are you going to be as responsive to them as if they came to you a little less angry, but just told you a story that tore your heart open and said, oh my word, now I can understand why you would be upset or why you might be angry. And how much more impressive that you actually reined it in a little bit for them and made it human rather than angry. Mike or Genty, any comments on taking anger into advocacy? So I actually, oh, sorry, Mike, I just stepped right in. Yeah, so I actually want to say, you know, I lived in Salinas when, uh, and I, you know, now my age is going to show, but in the late 1990s or mid 1990s, Salinas was the largest city that was planning to close down its library in the middle of the economic downturn. And it was extremely traumatic. This is the city that this is the place that was, you know, had the Nobel laureate, um, uh, John Steinbeck. We had the John Steinbeck library and the city was trying to close the library down. I had so much anger against the city council members. And as Mike mentioned, you know, city council members become, uh, you know, board of supervisors, become uh, your state legislators, they move up. It took me a very long time to get over that. You know, we were able, we did a lot of work, we did a lot of advocacy at the local level and kept the library open. But my anger stayed with me. It was so hard for me, you know, when it come, you know, it would come time for like our legislative day or something in the district. I really had so much resentment and anger about this. And it took me a long time to get over it. And then one of the things I realized, which as I grew up is, you know, people make mistakes. And we need to acknowledge that, that we need to say yes, or sometimes they make decisions and we don't know what the background, you know, what was behind it. And so really sometimes just saying, yeah, I didn't agree with that, but here is what I do agree with, or here is what I need from them. And so let me put this aside. So I think sort of being able to set your anger aside is also really important. And, you know, it is, we see like, and this is very much a part of what we talk about the cancel culture these days and all this, you know, holding on to resentment and making it spread through everything, how we respond to an author or how we respond to a film director or whatever it is. You know, we can't separate the work from the person. And really, it's important for us to be able to separate the two. And so I would say for me, that is something that I really learned as I move forward, that there are times you just have to say, we won't agree on everything or that, yes, you know, I don't know what the background was or whatever it is and say, let me set my anger aside and let me start and do the best I can for the future. We just pointed out that next time we do this, we need a tip slide in that whole series to talk about uh, it's personal and there's stories on it. And your slide reminds everybody, empathy is really important. I would suggest you haven't been on the wrong side of this many, many, many times, that when you can listen to somebody who is on the other side of a political spectrum from you and understand why they think the way they do, even if you don't agree, that's a great step toward advocacy and toward resolving problems. Because once you're empathetic and understand what's going on there, even if you don't agree with it, it's a step toward making the kind of connection you want. Mike, any other thoughts on anger in, in advocacy and how to deal with it? I don't think I could say anything better than John T. said, so... Okay, so let us deal with the dealing with opposition thing, which came up at the very beginning of the session. You see on the screen a, a slide, a screenshot of something from the Every Library site. There, somebody pointing out, yes, yes. There's a great article, and if you follow this link uh, after the session and, and download that article, it's basically a rewritten part of a chapter out of one of the two books that John and Patrick have written. What they're talking about here is not getting sucked into the drama of disagreement and being sidetracked by a bunch of ridiculous arguments. I mean, if you're running for governor, let's be honest here, we've all seen this. If you're running for governor and your best running mate is a bear at your press conference, you need to be concerned that the bear is getting more attention than you're getting. That's probably not the road you want to go down, nor do you want to be arguing about bears for the rest of your campaign. When people start attacking you for something you put on a ballot or something you're proposing in your community, to the best of your ability, diffuse it rationally, not in a state of anger, 
And again, call in advocates that can work with you and look for the underlying issue there. John Kraska tells a lovely story about a library director who was flummoxed by the idea that the library director did what many of you do, putting up books on different points of view on a particular political issue. And then start getting slammed on social media because the users of that particular library would go in and they wouldn't see any books from a conservative point of view, only the books from the liberal point of view were there. And the person was totally flummoxed and said to John, what do I do? I start out by putting all opinions out there, but it's a conservative community. So the conservative books get checked out, leaving only the liberal books there are there, giving the impression that we're only proposing the liberal point of view. And John said, why don't you just tell that story? What's the person did, which then caused the person to complain about it to come back and say, oh, I hadn't realized. What a nice thing, instead of being draw, drawn into it and getting angry about that and say, well, you didn't even bother to ask me, just offering that rational thing. So two points in there, argue as clearly and as, as lucidly as you can to give a point of view and then move on, but also think about what the issue is and, and contact very directly and unapologetically actually, in a way that makes people understand why you're doing what you're doing and get you there. This is a wonderful article. We'll be hearing a lot more about this in our November session with Patrick. And I hope that you'll join us for that. Let us in the time we've got Pat left here, do what I think is important in any kind of a training session and a discussion like we've been having here. Let us make sure this wasn't just two hours where you go, okay, stepped away, did that, now it's back to work. This is work. It's probably the most important thing you can do today. Think through what you've seen and heard today, what you said to each other, what we've read to you from some of those comments that were in the chat. For those of you watching the archive version, take this as a two or three minute exercise. Write down what you would see as three or four steps you can take in the next week or two that will take you down the path of advocacy that you want to go through. Now, that means if you want to make this real, think of a thing that is close to your heart that you want to advocate for. So take a few seconds to think about that and then just write down. I will do this, this, and this. And then we're gonna come back to the final slide to have people share that out. In the meantime, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask those. But I'll leave this up as a reminder to you that this is a quick exercise to jot down an action plan that you will develop to say, I got something out of this and I don't wanna forget it. This is what I'm gonna do with it. So questions, comments while you're doing that, anybody? Remember we're on Zoom, I can see you. You should be writing right now. <laughs> That'll teach you to keep your camera on. Yeah, I, I'm just going to respond to something Carol put in there saying, you know, she had reached out to Bill Dodd and he wanted nothing to do with the, her. You know, one of the things you could do, Carol, is actually look at his website, figure out the names of his uh, his staff and reach out to the staff because really the staff have a lot of power and they are the ones who will talk to him. So I just want to mention that you may have already done that. You sound like you're quite aware, but that is really one way to, to just, you know, say, okay, I'm going to reach out to the staff and go from there. And even if you reach to a, a junior member of the staff, that's okay. It's a good way to get started. Carol's has another lovely question here about um, how do we best serve the homeless community at the library? Let me start off with a quick story and then turn it over to people that are more attuned to day-to-day -day homeless issues in libraries. One thing I found in my own community here in San Francisco from a lot of conversations I've had with people is if we stop labeling people and say, oh, that's a homeless person and have all these stereotypes that go with that. Instead, have some sort of interaction if that's possible with them. It takes us a long way down that road of understanding what they need from us, what we need from them, and how we can work best together. I got in the habit, based on things that I've done with a lot of friends in my own neighborhood, of just actually greeting the people that are the regulars in the homeless parts of our neighborhood, just seeing them. And day by day, you know, just wave to them, say hello, once in a while ask how they are, they would ask how I am. A story that to this day still embarrasses me, but was a great learning point, was today I was walking past a small group of people I'd seen for months. I was walking past them kind of in a hurry, waved to them, they had just been given sandwiches by one of the local vendors. One of them says, hey, would you like a sandwich? And I stupidly said, oh, I'm in a hurry, just had lunch, and I walked away. And about five seconds later, I said, idiot, idiot, what would it have cost you to stop? and actually take a few bites of a sandwich with somebody in my in my neighborhood and actually had that breaking of bread with them which is so important so many things i do and to this day i think were i given another chance to do that i would immediately reverse the answer i had and make those few seconds to stop because that would have even further solidified the relationship we already have my being aware of them people that were troubled and and really facing difficult situations in my neighborhood and learn a little bit more about how we could have interacted mike deborah or genti any ideas about serving the homeless community in libraries as advocates. 
So one of the things, and you know, I'm not sure this is really uh, definitely advocacy. Uh, you would you can talk to your city council, and and some of it is really important, making sure your uh, your city manager or your county CAO or whoever is aware of what the impact is on your library, and but really focusing not on the impact on the library staff so much as impact on the rest of the users and on your ability to provide service. I think that is very, very important. It's not about library staff whining about what's going on, but it's about the actual ability to do work and how you're serving the community. And, you know, it's a huge issue. I mean, obviously I can't talk about everything, but I really do want to say one of the things is like one of the things we are working on and which many libraries, some have already done, is figuring out how to get your homeless users, your unhoused users, a library card. It's such a simple, basic thing. But how difficult is it for that, for someone who's already suffering from all of the impacts of homelessness to come in and every single time they want to use a computer, they have to ask you for a guest pass how hard would it be to find some way to give a card to an unhoused person, individual? Many unhoused users just want to use your computers, but then there are families who have children, who have school children who need more than computers. So really putting some thought into this, how do you serve your unhoused population? This is huge, it is important. Many of your unhoused population are voters, are now, so coming back to that voting issue, but really understanding that you are there to serve everyone and try to find that way. Do the most simple, the most basic of, of things, which is get them a library card and convince your staff of the importance because many of our staff are so, are so what should I say, like have this old fashioned idea of I need to protect all of the property in the library, I need to protect every book, I need to make sure every book comes back, get past that, think of the value of the, you know, serving your community and really trying to find a way. So I would say step one, find a way to get your homeless users uh, or unhoused users a library card. Thanks for the question about the homeless community. It makes me think I've just jotted down. That would probably be a wonderful topic for one of our follow-up sessions about advocating for members of our homeless community. So thanks for raising that issue. We do have a couple of questions that we're probably not gonna have time to get to today. Uh, Nicole had asked about overcoming concerns that libraries are not a federal issue. What I'd love to do is get us to the last part of this. And Nicole, if you wanna do a follow-up to any of us, I wanna put a slide up in just a minute that gives our contact info. Pop that question to us after the session. We'll try to get back to you. And I'll see if I can work that into one of our upcoming sessions. But rather than give a, a short cursory answer on that, let's give it the thought it deserves and do a follow-up with us. So those of you that have a chance now to think through what you're going to do, let's see if I've got that up there. There's our contact info. While we're doing that, uh, in the chat, please, say one thing that you will do in the next couple of weeks that is different from what you would have done before you came into that session. Let's see what your action plans are looking like. And the real question is, what will you do differently in the next week or two as a result of having participated in today's session? Anybody? While people are writing, I do just want to say something real quick to Nicole. You know, we get that a lot. And it, it's, you know, it, I, it's the same with education, right? There's um, education is locally funded, yet there's a federal department of education and education trickles down from the federal government with funding and requirements and other things. And so that is usually when I say that it is not Correct. It's not exclusively a federal issue, but there are resources that the federal government and the state de government dedicates to library services, and that's why this is important. Um, and that usually will help reframe it a little bit so that um, you acknowledge the concern, but also redirect to remind that there are allocations from this level that directly impact the work that local libraries are doing. Thank you, Mike, and thanks, Deborah, for also putting a follow-up in there so we did get that question answered. Deborah's answer was it's not a, regarding not a federal issue. They absolutely are, especially right now. If we don't get major federal funding in the infrastructure bill or amendments, it's our own fault. That takes us back to a really nice wrap as we look through what people are going to do in the next couple of weeks. It is our action to take. It is our responsibility and our joy to advocate for those things that are important to us. If not us, who? I've seen that Carol was one of the first people to respond to what will you do in the next couple of weeks. I won't be intimidated by anyone, which is great. I, I'm going to tell that to my cat and say, I'm not intimidated by you, but only as long as she's locked out of my room. It's a great point. And let's see. 
I'm not sure I'm seeing any others. I'm seeing some thank yous here. I'm seeing that we've got the note in how to reach us. Four short words, Build Americans Library Act. Thank you, Genty, for putting that in. Thank you, saying share those advocacy stories on the CLA website as something that she'll do. Thank you so much. There will be more of those coming. We've taken a brief hiatus while we focused on getting these live sessions going. It looks like another and, comment here. You can no. also post on our Facebook site, which is actually quite well followed. So we have both California Libraries and California Library Association Facebook sites, and you can certainly post stories there also to share. And it's a good way to inspire people who haven't weren't at this workshop who can hear what you have to say. And if you're one of those many people who want to honor the memory of Ursula Meyer, uh, when you get the link to this, post it out there, put it on your Facebook account, put it on your LinkedIn account, put it on your uh, Twitter account, Instagram, or anything else. Let us share the, the wonderful experience we've had here today of sharing these stories and giving people an idea of what they can do together when they're part of a community like this. I love all the comments we're getting here, all the thanks. Is there any other question that anybody wants to ask before we close this out and look forward to our next session with the Dillons, which will be in October on the 2nd uh, Wednesday of that month, and it'll be from 10 to 1130. It'll be a slightly shorter session. Any final questions from anybody? Panelists, one line wrap ups, anything you want to leave people with if there was only one thing they walked away with today? I'm going to say, reach out to us. We really would love to come and help you, talk to you. We are available. I, I would love to talk to whoever, your friends group, your foundations, yet your staff meeting, anyone. I would love to come and talk to you. And I know everyone on our group would be willing to do that. So. Thank you, Jenny. It's a good reminder that this program is very much in its early stages of development yet. And one of our dreams that we are hoping to be able to roll out eventually is these kind of one-time sessions that we do online, we could offer on a contract basis with libraries or library consortia in California that want to do it. So we're sort of working toward that, but nothing's definite yet. And if that appeals to you, certainly be in touch with me and with the other people at CLA so that we can pursue that and make it a meaningful and really good opportunity for everybody in Ursula's memory, as well as in honor of those people in our community that appreciate this. Mike or Deborah, any wrap up comments? It's really important. Your voice is really, really important. Um, they need to hear from us. Folks who are in positions of, of creating legislation and they're trying to do good deeds, but, but we need to tell them um, how we can help, but what we need also. And so don't be afraid. Just, you know, this, it gets to be fun after all. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. Mike. I would just say that you are all advocates and don't forget that. It's um, how you use your voice is your choice, but you are an advocate. And we're gonna go back to Jenty who just said she's got one more thing she'd like to add. I just want, I, you know, I saw Derek is here. I really want to thank Derek Wolfgram also, who was very instrumental in getting this all worked and helping us, you know, move forward with the Urs Ursula Myers Fund. And um, Hilary Thayer also, who helped us with the original planning of this program. So really big thank you to both Derek and Hilary. And of course, Paul, uh, you know, Deborah, Mike, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it so very, very much. With that said, thanks. Hope that it was a fruitful session. Hope that you build off it. We'll see you in a month. And if anybody wants to hang for a couple of minutes once the recording starts with any offline questions, I'll hang for at least a few more minutes. If you've got to run, understand that. Thanks for your patience with us, and we'll see you in a month. Take care.